हेलो एंड वेलकम टू दिस एपिसोड ऑफ द प्रिंट माइंड ओवर मैटर इस एपिसोड में मैं कुछ अलग करने वाली हूँ बिकॉज आई एम गोइंग टू हैव अ कॉन्वर्सेशन विद समबडी हु हैज बीन बैटलिंग विद बाइपोलर डिसऑर्डर फॉर क्वाइट सम टाइम एंड शी इज रिटन अ बुक अबाउट इट सो फॉर टुडे वी हैव विथ अस अपर्णा पिरमिल राजे हियर्स हाउ द इंटरव्यू वेंट वेलकम अपर्णा टू द प्रिंट एंड इट्स लवली टू हैव यू हियर and after reading a book it has been i think a very very insight it's a very insightful book and i think more than insightful what i think for me uh, that stood out uh, is that it's very honest it's very compelling and it doesn't try to layer uh, a lot of complexities or probably actually it's trying to de complexize whatever we look at whenever we think of something as a mental health condition or an issue um so this is my first question so in india when we talk about mental health it's still a area which is seen uh, which sees a lot of stigmatization it has a lot of stigma around it um so what in your opinion because i said that your book feels a lot like you know i can read like it, it often feels like a diary you know that i have been given access to so do it, what do you think that us as people and when i say us is like regular people what can we do uh to reduce this kind of stigma that still exists around mental health yeah it's a it's a great question i think that you know what i was really trying to do through the book was to normalize it first of all to say that it's possible to have a mental health condition and live what we call this normal life you know and that it it's not something that has to be that uh something that incapacitates you all the time yes there are times when you might be unwell but then all of us suffer from some illness at some point or the other you know so this is just right. to normalize it like any part of it so that i think is one big aspect of reducing the stigma so as i write in the book it's about you know i take antipsychotics i go to a psychiatrist i go to a therapist and that is normal for me and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that So now in order to do that how can ordinary people or anybody help is that i think you have to create safe spaces for that conversation to happen and that safe space could be as in your home it can be at at a friend's house or it can be very importantly at the workplace so i think we all understand the need for family to be supportive and i think we also understand the need for friends and community members neighbors to be supportive but i think we also must understand that workplaces need to be supportive because when people are often the stigma comes out because people worry about losing their job they don't want to actually tell people at work they don't want to tell their boss their colleagues their even the juniors that there is a problem because they are worried about those repercussions so in my experience when i was able to kind of tell the people i work with very openly that was really a game changer for me you know so i think those safe spaces for that conversation is is really important and then also um having just being role models in ourselves right because whenever i talk to people um they always will tell me that yeah so and so has a problem so and so has an issue so i think everybody knows somebody in their life so i think just coming out and and being better allies and being members of the community because what i say is mental health is a team sport that's mm. one of the big kind of lines in there so if right. if mental health is a team sport then all of us are part of that team right so then i guess i can also say that in a way you know your book also becomes a safe space for people who may not yet understand you know because again if i say that mental health itself is so stigmatized it sometimes probably us as individuals who may be experiencing it you know before we can even move on to the stage or stage of uh, saying it to somebody else or asking for help i think sometimes we don't even realize on our own that okay you know there's something happening which is not on a physical level maybe this it's on some other level which we may not have the language for so i mean at least for me it felt like that uh, i have myself been in therapy for more than a year now uh, but obviously i do feel that it has been actually late for me that i should have started much earlier but despite you know with all of my education and privilege i still felt like you know um maybe you know i can handle this or something like that as you just mentioned and it was such an important point that sometimes you know workplaces or sometimes they provide the space we are so not used to the idea of talking about everything uh, specifically when it comes to mental health with others that it becomes very difficult even for an individual no matter how safe we feel to have that conversation with an employer maybe or you know our colleagues so for me i felt like you know the book also felt a lot like a safe space where i'm reading about somebody's account 
uh, which is honest, which is talking about the struggles, talking about the good days and the bad days, which which are all part of, as you say, uh, the normal life of somebody who's uh, struggling. I think. Um, uh, so my next question is, you know, if you could share, you know, the journey itself of, you know, writing this book, because in a lot of the sections of the book, you've also talked about, like you've, you know, phased it out, you know, from the beginning, uh, you know, how you went about it, you know, from your marriage to, you know, how your interactions with your family. And there are also very powerful lines in a uh, book specifically for, for me, which stood out about the writing of, writing down of your emotions. Something that, again, therapists often recommend uh, when you start therapy that, you know, just learn to write down what you're feeling as opposed to immediately uh, trying to make sense of everything. So if you could tell us more about that. Yeah, well, I, as you would also, as you've also expressed, you know, I love writing. And so I've always been writing ever since I was quite young. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I officially accepted the diagnosis, which was back in 20, 2013, mm -hmm. about 18 months after that, um, I wrote a note called 10 things I've learned about being bipolar. And that was actually the template for this book. And so that was a short note. And I just sent it to my immediate family, a few friends and uh, my doctors, and they really liked it. And they said, you should do more of this. Um, and then I shared it with my book club. So when you come to this whole issue of safe spaces, the book club was a really uh, safe space for me to share that writing. And um, they saw it and they all said, uh, you must do more with this. And this was actually seven years ago. Um, and then I kept wanting to write it, but I was having a lot of mood swings. So I, I didn't have enough distance from the material. Um, and so I, I would write a chapter and then I, I just wouldn't get much further. I wouldn't be able to write the next chapter. Um, and then actually it was only when the lockdown happened that it really gave me a lot of time and space and focus. And, you know, I know the lockdown has been so difficult for the whole world, but actually for me in my writing, and I think for many writers around the world, it did produce books. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I did manage to do uh, the, the book during the, during the lockdown. So that's when I found some space to, to work on it. And by then I had had enough distance from all the emotions. So writing for me has always yeah, been very therapeutic. Okay. Um, so bipolar disorder, again, is not just something that's not very well known among people or often, you know, it's used in a certain way, which is why probably it's also often very misunderstood. You know, when we, when we say, oh, somebody's bipolar, we use it very casually without really understanding the implications. It's not a choice that a person is exhibiting or, you know, dealing with this. So how do you think, or how would you place your book in at least um, unlearning about this whole idea of bipolar? Or what does it really mean as opposed to, let's say, often how we use it? So what do you think are the biggest myths or stigmas associated with being bipolar? What, at least it's something uh, that, the ones that I have heard when I have talked to people, they say somebody's bipolar is like, they just exhibit extreme behavior, which is like both ended. And uh, I, I feel like when people say that, like, oh, somebody's ex exhibiting extreme behavior, like, yeah, you're very nice to somebody. And then on the other moment, you are, you know, completely horrible to them. Uh, I have a sense that people think that there is a control that this person have or this behavior, but they're still choosing to behave like this. It, it's, I, I, for me, I think that was one of the biggest issues I had when I realized that, you know, people understand bipolar as something that's choice-based. Like they don't see it as uh, associated with mental health. They rather see it as a more person, completely a personality issue. Oh yeah. So, so one of the main things the myths that I want to dispel through this book is that there is a difference between personality and illness. So you yes. can, I, I would actually say that I have a pretty calm personality. I like to think I'm a pretty chill person, you know, but yeah. I do have this condition and, and this condition does take me on occasion to these extremes. And for, it is important to note also that there is a role of psychology, that there are triggers that would take mm -hmm. me to the extreme, but then there are chemical imbalances. So the way I would explain it is that if I haven't slept for five days in a row, I am going to have a chemical imbalance issue and I'm likely to get manic. But what is it that's keeping me up for five nights in a row? That thing is, is a probably a psychological issue. So I think that there are many myths and stigmas around bipolarity that like this would be explained. This is a very important one. Others like the fact of, you know, I think the fact is that we are all on a spectrum. You know, and, and even what I realized also, it's not that you are just by, uh, manic or just depressive. You are on any given day, you could be anywhere on that spectrum, you know, and so is any normal person. Like some days you're down, some days you're up. 
it's just that my swings may be more you know if, if i get angry i may get a little bit angrier than the than the average person but i so i need to control and regulate those emotions more than somebody else you know so um i i think that uh, when you hear somebody's you know personal experiences and their analysis and also there are many other voices in this book right so i think that um, there i've interviewed about 75 people uh, in my ecosystem as well as outside the ecosystem so people could learn a lot from those interviews also uh you've often spoken all through the book in fact when you even begin the book you've talked about you know your family support or you know how you've negotiated a lot of um your experiences by you know communicating uh, your you know it to them i just wanted to understand how important do you think is uh, you know family support or even the support of a partner for example for for therapy to be more successful then you know let's say if i'm doing it alone completely by myself and i'm taking therapy you know what's the difference there yeah so i think all of these seven therapies that i've talked are kind of complementary and and really when they come together there's there's a sort of planetary alignment as i call it you know because all the kind of everything sort of aligned and it really helps you but the one that has the biggest impact i would say is definitely family which is what i call love therapy and it doesn't have to be uh necessarily just family it could be any loved one relationship the people who are close to you in your life you know um because what what they do is they really accept they accept you for what you are and they give you that space to be yourself okay they give you space to heal and recover i mean let's say i am the prime i am the primary caregiver of my family i have two sons um i am the primary giver caregiver of them but if i am unwell i cannot look after them right if i if i had jaundice today i would not be able to look after them somebody would have to step in and look after them in my place same thing with a mental health condition right so having that understanding um and having that acceptance of of this is who you are um, i think if if a family doesn't provide that it's very difficult to get that from anyone else uh, in addition to what you just mentioned that you know you give example that you know if 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 you are or if i am on the primary care group of a family and you know like there are dependents on me and if i'm not well you know mentally and obviously i cannot um so i have two questions actually related to this or more like you know something that probably i was expect hoping that you could tell my audience a the importance of first taking care of ourselves which uh i think among women is a trait that we constantly need to unlearn because we have been no matter how you know educated we are or how privileged we are in certain spaces we still have this sort of ingrained idea that you have to give up a part of yourself you know to be more available to somebody else and that is what makes you i don't know a better person maybe one is that and the other aspect is because you mentioned it you know as a mother again you know i think that's more expected certain things are more expected out of a mother you know the self sacrifice and the giving nature and all of it um i think that that seems to be part of the deal it's almost like part of the package deal and i do you think that that makes this journey let's say for women in general and let's say mothers you know caregivers in particular more difficult because you know they have to balance where you know the boundaries the concept of boundaries basically where you have to unfortunately or fortunately draw boundaries even with not just people that you don't like of course but with very people that you absolutely love and can do anything for where you have to still draw boundaries so that you can first take care of yourself and then give the kind of care that let's say uh, people dependent on you or people close to you uh, expect from you yeah uh, you know i'll just say it very simply the best mom is a happy mom okay you if i don't take care of my health i cannot take care of anyone else and i think it's really important for society to understand that and for anyone to prioritize the health of the primary caregiver i think that's because she is there to help anyone and if she is not healthy she can't do that right um so again you know today let's say in 2022 uh, a lot of us maybe uh, have been are beginning to use a lot of terms associated with mental health whether you know terms like anxiety or you know even words like safe space you know or anything you know wellness if if not mental health per se let's say mental wellness have, these are terms that have become pretty frequent in our vocabulary i was just wondering uh, you know what would be your take on this idea that while of course we have more access or there are you know these terms are being used more easily more frequently or maybe they are finding a space 
where they can be used easily. Do you think there's also a flip side to it where, you know, like I just gave you the example of how the word bipolar is often used, you know, instead of it being referred to with the connotations that it comes, you know, it's often used as, I don't know, sometimes like an insult, sometimes like an excuse, you know, with all kind of connotations. So I was wondering if it's actually a two-edged sword, double-edged sword. Uh, I mean, I know where you're coming from, but I think that what we're living in a time where we've just had a two-year lockdown and pandemic, I think it's been very difficult for people, um, even people who may not have otherwise showed symptoms of any kind of mental distress, have had to deal with things that have been very difficult, losses in the family, job losses. So I'm inclined to be quite empathetic uh, to this scenario. And I would rather have more discussion rather than less discussion. And I and I just recognize that, in fact, what I would like to say with, with my book also is that, you know, I'm trying to say that even with a bipolar is classified as a serious mental health condition, right? It's like it's up there with something like what we would consider schizophrenia to be like a pretty serious mental health condition. So I would say that even if you have something as serious as that, you could still thrive and live a life. You know, I know that to somebody who's suffering from depression, it might not seem that it's not serious, but it is a more relatively stress, anxiety, depression are relatively more common disorder, uh, not disorders, but conditions, um, you know, than, uh, than, than things like bipolar. So what I'm trying to say is that all of these things can be managed. And I, I, I think that I'm OK with people using these words, even if they're using, using them a little bit casually, at least they're trying to understand that they're, they're, they're trying to you know look for meaning um and and trying to sort of understand but otherwise people don't discuss it at all so, and the number of people who've been writing to me saying they've lost you know family members or family members have had to be institutionalized or separated uh, because they've not had any treatment and they've not had right. adequate treatment is is astonishing um okay so i want to know what what you think of um, how important it is, or do you think if you have any, you know, opinions about the idea of how early do we start to discuss? Like we have all of these discussions with children, you know, in families that kuch cheeze hum bachpan se shuru kar dena chahiye. You know, this is a common saying that we have about a lot of things. Uh, how early do you think we should start probably having the kind of discussions on mental wellness with, let's say, children? Or because again, you know, a lot of children, like you pointed out, you know, COVID meant a difficult time for everybody and it included children, you know, teenagers who could not meet friends, who just could not get out of the house even to, you know, play and they were at the most risk because, you know, even though older people got, you know, vaccines, you know, children weren't vaccinated, teens weren't vaccinated, you know, their life sort of completely came to a standstill. So I was wondering what would you have to say about that? Like how early do you think we should start discussions, at least within our families, if not, if not at an institutional level, but within families? I see that my uh, son's schools start doing it in adolescence. And I, I think that's a good time to start. You know, I think they, 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 they discuss mental health and wellness quite early on. And I think that's good because, you know, we have unfortunately very high rates of suicide in our country for young people. Right. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of stresses related to exams, academic pressures. Um, so I think that the, we start in, uh, uh, while they're adolescents, that's a good time. Okay. Um, so this would actually be my last question that while your book, like I've again said, and it is, uh, is almost like a roadmap for people who are not just struggling probably with bipolar, but even for anybody who may, like I said earlier, that may not be able to make sense of what they're experiencing, or maybe it gives them a space where they can read about somebody else going through it. So I was wondering uh, what, uh, any if you had any suggestion for somebody who's still not um, had the conversation with themselves maybe. Uh, yeah. yeah, this book is a 20 year journey, you know. So I, I think that what I'm encouraging people to do is to really get on that journey. And this is just a template. It's uh, it's not the Bible. It's right. not a textbook. You know, it's it's just a template and they can pick and choose what works for them. But it's really start important to start having that conversation, you know, just to be happier. I mean, unfortunately, India, whether you accept these rankings or not, but India ranks very low on the happiness yeah. rankings. Mm -hmm. So whether, like I said, whether or not you accept those rankings, um, I think a lot of this is about finding that peace within and finding that joy with it. Um, thank you, Abona, so much for, you know, talking to us today and sharing so much 
things that so many insights actually uh you not just about obviously your own journey but also generally about mental wellness and i think this would really really help the viewers okay thank you so much thank uh, you so much for having me